Okay, great. Uh, so thanks everybody for your time and thank you for, um, you know, RSVPing and being here in a timely manner. Uh, we definitely appreciate that. So uh, before we get into introductions of our three speakers today, I did just want to uh, briefly go over some sort of housekeeping. So if you have a question throughout the session, you can look toward the bottom of your screen and you'll see a Q&A button. It's, it literally says Q&A. Uh, and that's where you can ask a question. So don't wait until the end. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation from our three speakers. Uh, just you know, feel free as you go to put them in there. I'll monitor that and I'll be kind of moderating the Q&A uh, when we get to that session, okay? Uh, okay, so our three speakers today we have uh, in no particular order, Emily Buckholz. Uh, she's an outpatient registered dietitian at New York Presbyterian Hospital in uh, Wild Cornell. She specializes in nutritional care of patients with cancer. Emily is an advocate and proponent of nutrition and exercise as integral to caring for patients throughout the prevention, treatment, and survivorship continuum of cancer care. Francesca Maglione, also a registered dietitian on the outpatient oncology team at New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell. Francesca takes care of oncology patients in the STAR-3 Infusion Center, Stitch Radiation, Patient 6 Pediatric Infusion, and through the NYP Outpatient Nutrition Practice. She's an advocate for optimizing nutrition for oncology patients. And last but certainly not least is Stephanie Reut, uh, again an outpatient registered dietitian at NYP Wall Cornell, specializing in nutritional care of patients with cancer. Stephanie combines her passions for food and science providing nutrition counseling for patients during and after cancer treatment to help them get their best nutrition and maximize their quality of life. Stephanie currently sees patients receiving radiation and chemotherapy, including but not limited to patients with head and neck, prostate, lung, and gastrointestinal cancers. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to the three of you, and I believe Stephanie, you're first. Yeah. Hi, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. We hope everyone's staying healthy and safe at home with the quarantine. Um, we wanted to review some of the main topics today that I know a lot of the three of us are getting questions about from our patients. Um, some topics that we think are especially important if you have been diagnosed with cancer and are getting treatment or a survivor of cancer. Um, so I'm gonna talk about our first topic today, um, which is food safety. Um, so really the most important thing to remember about food safety during this time is that it's actually one of the most important things that you want to think about all the time. So anyone that is undergoing cancer treatment, you want to be really careful about food safety. Um, so I'm going to go over just some of the basic food safety practices that we usually recommend for cancer patients. Um, and that's usually just following the USDA guidelines for cancer patients for food safety. Um, one thing that we're hearing a lot about in the news is hand washing. It's probably something that we're all doing very frequently throughout the day. Um, and just like they say from the CDC, you want to make sure that you're hand washing with soap for at least 20 seconds. And you want to make sure you're getting all the areas of your hands and your fingertips when you do that. Um, it's most important as far as a food safety perspective to be doing this before you're making food or if someone else is helping to prepare food for you, you wanna make sure that they're also following these practices as well. As when it comes to the food itself, you wanna make sure that any produce that you're gonna be eating that could be raw, that you wanna wash that thoroughly. Um, we recommend just washing it under running water. I don't recommend using soap because some fruits and vegetables are more porous, so they can actually absorb some of the soap. So a lot of people ask, should I be washing my fruit with soap? But I say no, just use running water and do it for the same amount of time for 20 seconds and make sure that you're getting everything thoroughly. Um, there are some rougher fruits that you wanna go ahead and wash and kind of scrub with a scrub brush if you have one of those. Um, and you, that would be something like an avocado that has like a rougher skin or a melon. You wanna make sure that you wash the outside of that before you cut into it. That way you're preventing any bacteria that could be on the outside from transferring to the inside. Then same thing, if you're doing foods that are come in a can or in a jar, I always recommend making sure that you're choosing a jar and a can that doesn't look like it's been opened or damaged and wash the jar and the can when you get home from the grocery store. I think that's a really easy way just to make sure that there's nothing that will get into the can when you're opening it. And again, this is something that I recommend people do all the time. 
Um, and it's just something that you want to be extra careful about when you're undergoing cancer treatment. I don't recommend washing all foods. Um, meats have a high risk for bacteria when they're raw. So we actually don't recommend rinsing those before because they can actually spread the germs with the water if you're rinsing them. So we don't recommend washing all of your foods. It's more just like your, your produce um, and any cans or jarred products. You want to wash the outside. Um, when it comes to meats and fish and all of those proteins that a lot of us are using, um, it's best to not have them undercooked or unpasteurized. You want to choose pasteurized dairy products. Um, so that'd be any of your cheeses or milk. You don't want to have any raw products because those can be a high risk for bacteria. And you want to make sure that your meats and fish are also cooked through thoroughly. Um, as far as perishable foods, just be mindful that you're getting those in the fridge when you get home from the grocery store. Don't leave anything sitting out at room temperature because that's the best temperature for bacteria to grow. So we want to make sure we keep everything in the fridge and not leaving anything out on the counter. Um, and then I would say just frequently sanitize your kitchen surfaces. Um, there's a link to a handout and it has a great guide for sanitizing surfaces and gives you, you know, information on temperature logs and things like that. So if you guys want a little bit more information on the best way to do that, you can go ahead and click the link. It has a nice handout. But I would just regularly sanitize your kitchen surfaces. Again, it's just to keep um, your kitchen clean is very important all the time just to make sure there's not bacteria there that could be growing. And then the next slide. And then I know a lot of people are asking about coronavirus in particular. Um, according to the FDA, the CDC, and the USDA, there's currently no evidence to suggest that COVID-19 can be transmitted through food or food packaging. Um, so what I'm advising you know, my patients to do, what I'm doing at home, is just following those general food safety guidelines and also making sure that you're washing your hands um, before and after you go to the grocery store. So when you get home, I say wash your hands, and then once you put everything away, I just recommend washing your hands again. Um, I do recommend following the produce washing that I talked about in the last slide, so make sure you're rinsing it for at least 20 seconds, especially if it's something where you're going to be cutting the fruit or vegetable and eating it raw. I think it's a good step to take. Um, I would avoid sharing any utensils or plates of food or beverages with others, so I usually say to avoid like communal plating and things like that. Most of us are kind of eating at home or eating takeout, um, but just even if there's anybody in your household, maybe that is having a little bit more interaction with other people. Just keep it on a separate plate, use different utensils than they do. And that can just, again, help reduce your risk for transmitting any bacteria. Um, and then also if anyone's getting takeout, I know a lot of restaurants are doing that. Um, I usually recommend just, you know, after you receive the takeout, you wash your hands before you eat. So it's kind of a similar thing. You always wanna wash your hands before you cook and before you eat. So if you're gonna be ordering takeout from a restaurant, I would say, receive the takeout in a safe manner, have somebody get that for you and you can transfer it to a plate and then just wash your hands before you eat. Um, when it comes to food shopping, which we'll have a little bit more information for you guys in a bit, um, but I recommend just making sure that you're limiting your trips to the grocery store like the CDC is recommending and only going when you need something. So um, I recommend planning your shopping trips in advance. It helps you to limit how much time you spend in the grocery store. And then again, make sure you're washing your hands after you get home from the store. Um, I know that some stores have special hours where you can do shopping that are less crowded. Um, so for immunocompromised patients, that might be something worth looking into at your local grocery store or even having a friend um, help you shop or getting a food delivery from the grocery store instead. So you have a lot of different options um, right now, which can help you to get the groceries that you need. Um, and on that topic, I'll pass it over to Emily, who will help talk a little bit more um, about that. Hello, everyone. I'm Emily. So today we're going to be talking about different pantry staples, so foods that last longer. Um, because as Stephanie was saying, we want to really try to limit how often we're going to the grocery store. And so usually most people end up shopping once a week, maybe you know, every other week. And right now we're really trying to minimize going to the grocery store and stock up on as much food as we can and make it last for three weeks to even a month. And so a lot of these shelf-stable foods sometimes are not the healthiest. They're packed with sodium and refined sugars and things like that. So I wanted to 
create a list of guidance that not only is shelf stable that can last you weeks to months on a shelf but is also very healthy nutritionally dense nutritionally packed and also it has really good flavor and taste so you don't want to compromise on any of those things so if you look here i put together a few proteins that are both shelf stable and refrigerated and i tried to come up with a mix of different plant-based proteins and also some different animal protein products as well so if you look at the shelf stable proteins category it has some plant-based proteins, so things like beans, chickpeas, lentils, nuts and nut butters, which you can purchase in a can, or you can actually purchase them fresh and freeze them yourself. So those are some really great ways to get some plant-based proteins in that will last you a long time. In addition to some fish options, so they often have canned tuna, salmon, and sardines available, which will also last months on your shelf. If you are someone that doesn't really like to use cans, they also now have these foods in different little pouches, which are also another alternative. As far as refrigerated and frozen protein foods, so meat usually freezes really well. So different things like poultry, fish, beef. Um, if you're someone that doesn't like to buy fresh meat and then freeze it yourself, they also have options where you can buy frozen turkey burgers and chicken burgers and salmon burgers, even veggie burgers. They're already frozen. You just throw them in the freezer and they can last you a very long time. We also have different refrigerator options. So things like edamame, which can also be frozen, hummus, tofu, eggs, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, cheeses those can usually last several weeks, even up to a month in your refrigerator. As far as grains, so grains are also a really essential, essential nutritional food that we need to consume. And so grains are packed with fiber and protein and different trace minerals, and these can last a very long time on our shelves. So a few different grain options that I left for you guys is different types of breads, so when we're looking for bread or crackers, we really want to make sure it says whole wheat or multi-grain. And then some other great options are things like oatmeal, quinoa, brown rice, barley, farro, amaranth, and even pastas. When we're choosing pastas, we really want to try to avoid using the white flours and look for things like whole wheat pasta, or they now are even making pastas made from chickpeas and lentils, which have a ton of protein. Next slide. So as far as fruits and vegetables go, I often find this the hardest thing to shop for, um, especially when you're going to the grocery store less frequently. I find that a lot of my favorite fruits tend to go bad very quickly and you know you don't want to feel like you're you know compromising and throwing away fruits and not getting enough fruit so i put together a few little tips on how to feel like you can stock up on fruits and vegetables and help keep them last longer so fresh fruits and vegetables are great when you're buying fresh fruits you know try to buy some of the fruits that last longer in the fridge so those would be things like apples pears bananas citrus fruits oranges things like that those can last up to a month in the refrigerator for things like berries or melon or pineapple or things like that that are going to go bad faster you can always buy buy them fresh and freeze them yourself and so all you would have to do is wash them thoroughly like what steph said and then you chop them into small pieces put them in a ziploc bag and then you can store them for as long as you want the other option is just buying them pre-frozen so i often get asked is frozen fruits and vegetables healthy? Does it have as many nutrients as fresh? And what we know is frozen fruits and vegetables are picked at peak ripeness and then flash frozen. So that way they're maximizing all the nutritional value and they're lasting a very long time in the, the freezer. So by no means, do you, you know, if you find that you don't want to chop up fruits and vegetables yourself, you'd rather buy them fresh frozen, that is, an, that is another alternative. Um, just make sure as a disclaimer that you're looking for plain vegetables or plain fruits because oftentimes 
frozen vegetables can sometimes add extra butters or sauces, which can add a lot of saturated fat and sodium. And sometimes these frozen fruits, if they're not plain, can add syrups and other sugars that can also you know, provide extra calories that we're not wanting. For, um, for, frozen, for vegetables, if you would like, so buying fresh vegetables is great, same with frozen. Or you can also take the initiative to buy produce and vegetables and freeze them yourself. So in order to do this, the vegetables with low water content tend to freeze better. So those would be things like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, string beans. So those would be great options for freezing yourself. And so what you would do is you would wash and chop the vegetables, blanch in boiling water for a minute, then immediately place under cold running water. You would cut them up and then put them in the freezer. The other, you know, foods like tomatoes and lettuce and cucumber, so things like that that have very low, high water content, those would not be great for freezing. However, they do last pretty long in the refrigerator. Next. All right, so thank you, Antonio and Stephanie and Emily. Um, my name is Francesca and I'm gonna be talking about uh, supplementation during um, this situation, but especially for people who are also undergoing cancer treatment during this time. So first of all, I just wanna do a brief overview of typically using supplements during cancer treatment. Uh, the one I wanna focus on is antioxidant supplements. So these are gonna be your vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, selenium, maybe an emergency type uh, supplement, lycopene, resveratrol, anything that has flavonoids, anthocyanins, catechins, or anything that might have um, immune boosting proprietary blends on the label. So those would all fall under the umbrella of antioxidants. And as we see from many studies, two of the most notable are like the Women's Health Study and the SELECT trial, is that there really isn't any clear evidence that there's a benefit for patients to be using antioxidant supplements during treatment. So that's the first thing, is that without any clear benefit, it's really hard to recommend something. Um, because we just don't know that that is gonna do anything. The next thing that's really important to be aware of is that these supplements could actually render chemotherapy and radiation less effective. So what we see happening in the body is that um, chemotherapy is trying to kill cancer cells and the antioxidants are trying to protect cells. And the antioxidants are not really able to tell the difference between healthy cells and cancer cells, and therefore there's a potential for them to protect cancer cells as well as healthy cells during the time when we're taking medication to actively kill those cells. Same thing can happen with radiation. In radiation, something's produced called ROS or reactive oxygen species, and these are typically harmful to cells. But in the aspect that we are trying to actively kill cancer cells, we want that to be happening and there's the potential for antioxidants to have the opposite effect and stop that process from happening. Um, and then beyond just your normal chemotherapy medications or radiation, there's a potential for supplements to interfere with other medications that you may be taking. So for example, is that if you're taking blood thinners and you're taking vitamin E, there's a potential to increase the effectiveness of blood thinners, which could be really dangerous while you're receiving chemotherapy or radiation. And so the other side of the coin with supplementing is that a lot of the times when we do supplement these nutrients, we're taking in doses, dosages that are over 100% daily value of what's recommended. Sometimes it could be in the thousands, so way more than 100%. And there's a potential for us to not really even absorb that much of these nutrients. For example, we could really only absorb, um, I think it's like 300 milligrams of vitamin C at a time, 500 milligrams maybe max. 
And it's very common for supplements to have far more than that. And therefore, we're not even absorbing all of those nutrients we're taking into our body. If we take high doses of um, one or two specific nutrients, there's the potential to interfere with absorption of other nutrients. Um, and we'll go into that a little bit later with some of the um, nutrients that were, um, there's a question about it. So we'll go more into that. But um, and one example is vitamin C. If we take a lot of, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, so if we take a ton of vitamin C, it could interfere with copper absorption. And there's other nutrients that could have that same reaction as well. And the other thing with taking very high dose nutrient supplements is that there could be side effects with this, just like taking a medication could have side effects. And so you could have nausea, you could have upset stomach, you could have diarrhea. These could be symptoms that might be also side effects of medications you're taking, chemotherapy, radiation. And so there's the potential for these supplements to um, exacerbate symptoms that you're already having or mass symptoms. So you may be taking a high dose of a supplement and be having symptoms, um, thinking it's from the chemotherapy. In reality, it could be just from a vitamin or mineral supplement. And um, obviously going through cancer treatment, we're already treating cancer, but there is the potential for certain nutrients in very high doses to promote the risk of developing certain types of cancer. For example, high doses of beta carotene, especially in smokers, is seen with an increased risk of lung cancer. High doses of vitamin E and selenium is seen with an increased risk of prostate cancer. So more isn't always better when it comes to these supplements, but unfortunately when we're taking them in the form of dietary supplements, um, it's very common for the doses to be excessive. Um, so I just wanna mention one more thing on this slide and that's not written there, but you know, the reason why I picked antioxidants to highlight is I think that's the type of supplements that's getting a lot of hype and a lot of um, exposure right now when it comes to respiratory infections, including COVID-19, is because um, a lot of people typically, when they're getting the common cold, when they're getting the flu, they start taking high-dose vitamin C, high-dose emergency, selenium, they start taking these antioxidant supplements. So even though um, that may be common, um, especially if you're undergoing treatment right now with chemo or radiation, um, it does not make that a safe choice. Um, and still there is very limited evidence showing that taking high doses of vitamin C and taking high doses of other antioxidants um, does very much in the way of the common cold. And especially since this is such a new disease, we really don't have any evidence that taking supplements is going to do anything for this condition, except possibly um, put you at risk in other ways or complicate symptoms in other ways. So we go to the next slide now. And this slide, you know, it's gonna look a little repetitive, but it's really important that um, this is something that is understood is that right now there is no evidence at all showing that any dietary supplement can prevent, treat, diagnose, or cure COVID-19. And if a supplement is saying that it can do any of those things, there's a good chance that it's a scam and it could be potentially dangerous um, because the FDA does not regulate any of these supplements. And so we have no idea what's going into them, what's actually in the product, what the doses actually are. Are there byproducts from manufacturing? Um, things that could be really harmful to our bodies. And finally, I just wanna close off with, if you see something, um, a marketing ad, promotion, something saying that they are claiming to prevent, treat, diagnose or cure COVID-19, um, that there is a way for you to check to see if they are being notified by the FTC for fraudulent claims. And I checked this morning, the last time I checked, there were about 45 companies that have received letters from the FTC. Um, and I was going through some of the claims and, and these companies are absolutely claiming we will treat COVID-19. Um, I saw essential oils. I saw CBD oil. I saw vitamin and mineral supplements. So it's across the board. Companies right now are trying to profit off of this. Um, so it's really important to be a savvy consumer and put your health first because they have really good marketing and their goal is to sell you a product. Their goal isn't actually to help you prevent getting COVID-19. Um, and so it's really important to kind of put on your savvy consumer hat and be very aware of that. 
especially during this time. And it's really nice that we have some of these resources um, to make those informed decisions right now. So I'm glad they're putting that information out there. And then we can move on to the, to the last slide. Okay. And so with what Steph and Emily said and what I said myself, really these are all things that uh, we as oncology dietitians are experts in talking to patients about um, motivating counseling and advising people on on a very individualized basis and so if you feel like any of this has left you with more questions you know this is a great opportunity to get in touch with one of us and have an individualized consultation and receive an individualized nutrition plan and have all of your specific questions answered um, by someone who is looking at you as a whole person and taking everything about you into account, your food preferences, your past medical history, your medications, your goals, which is really like the number one thing when it comes to making nutrition changes. What do you plan to get out of it? Um, and so some ways that you could get in touch with us would be through Epic Connect. So if you have a patient portal, a MyChart account, you could message us through there. And if not, um, you've never met with a dietitian before, you're not sure who to reach out to, you can contact Health Outreach and um, they will help coordinate. Um, and with any nutrition consultation who does require a physician referral or order. Um, so thank you very much for attending this webinar. Thank you, Antonio, for hosting it. I'm gonna give it back over to Antonio now. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Francesca and Stephanie and Emily. That was uh, really comprehensive in 30 minutes. I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so there were a few questions that came in the Q&A, but maybe we could start with the pre-questions we got while folks were RSVPing. Um, so there were two. The first one here, it says, can you specify the best ways through food, beverages, and supplements to address deficiencies in magnesium, zinc, and folic acid? So I'll, I'll leave it up to you, whoever wants to answer that, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that one. Francesca will take that one. Um, yeah, so that's why I said I would, I would kind of come back to this. So um, this is a really great question. Um, pretty interesting nutrients that were picked, I think. Um, I'm assuming somebody has these nutrient deficiencies. Um, so we'll, we'll go through them one at a time. So first of all, for zinc, I think that was the first one, is women need about eight milligrams of zinc a day and men need about 11 milligrams of zinc per day. Now there are some health conditions that can make people need more zinc because they're not able to absorb that much. So GI conditions, um, alcoholism, um, those are some common ones that may put someone in the category of um, a deficiency. Um, so some foods that are really high in zinc are going to be oysters, beef, um, crab, beans, pumpkin seeds, yogurt, um, poultry, dairy, fortified cereals, a ton of cereals will have a good at least like 20-30% of your daily zinc value added to it. Um, which is very common, nuts, beans, I think I said pumpkin seeds already. So there's a lot of foods that are going to get you zinc. Um, what I see commonly when it comes to, so that's the food part of that. What I see commonly when it comes to zinc supplements is that they're, they're very high dose zinc supplements. Sometimes you could find one that's about five milligrams, but more often they're in the 30 milligram range. So um, that's where I would say meeting with a dietitian to find out individualized, you know, specifically why you're deficient to make sure that a supplement's appropriate for you is really important before you start a supplement on your own, but you're actually getting more zinc than you think and you don't have an issue with absorption and then you could put yourself at risk for having too much zinc. Um, which could then interfere with some other nutrient absorptions, um, which is where we get into that category of like, like for example, if you take too much zinc in supplement, that could interfere with magnesium absorption. So we'll kind of use that as a segue now. Um, so with magnesium, women need about 300 milligrams per day. Men need about 400 milligrams per day. Some good sources of magnesium are going to be nuts, pumpkin seeds, spinach, fortified cereals, beans, beef, 
Interestingly enough, there is some overlap there and we'll see some similar overlap with folate as well, which is a nice thing if you're trying to target all three of those nutrient deficiencies at the same time. Um, so with supplementation of magnesium, um, you want to make sure that you're going to be picking a source of magnesium that is well absorbed. If you do feel that you need to absorb magnesium, um, a common way people actually take magnesium in supplemental form is for laxative use. Um, so that's another factor is like if you're taking magnesium, a magnesium based laxative already, you may actually be getting some magnesium supplementally in that form. Um, but there are some forms that are more absorbed better than others. So like aspartate, citrate, lactate, and chloride forms of magnesium are going to be better absorbed. So once again, if you're picking a magnesium supplement, you've worked with someone, you've talked to someone already, we found out that yes, you are deficient, you would benefit from a supplement. Making sure that you're getting the form that is going to be well absorbed. And once again, keeping in mind that total recommended needs for the day and trying not to exceed that number especially if you're already getting some from food and you don't have any issues with absorption that are going to um, put you at risk. So those conditions might be, once again, like GI disorders, um, alcohol dependence, if people who are older tend to need more magnesium and people with diabetes might need more magnesium. Um, and then so the final one that was mentioned was folate. So for folate, we typically need about like 400 micrograms a day. So much smaller amount. Foods that are going to give you folate are going to be your beef, your spinach, your beans, your nuts, some vegetables. Like your green leafy vegetables are a good way to think about folate. Asparagus, Brussels sprouts, avocado, lettuce, spinach, kale, those kind of foods will get you some folate. Um, once again, rice and cereals will be fortified with it. So if you have some kind of cereal in your diet, it's likely that you're getting some fortification in there already. Um, Folate is one of those nutrients that, once again, we could overdo it with. So taking high, high doses of folate or folic acid um, has been shown to promote the development and progression of cancer. So specifically related to this conversation, um, it's really important to keep in mind that like more is not always better. However, um, if you have any kind of GI issues, if you have some other reason why you may be deficient, um, Mostly it's a malabsorption issue um, or alcohol use disorder, which tends to reduce our absorption of a lot of nutrients. Um, there may be some benefit to that. And some people will either use folic acid or methylfolate, which is a reduced form of folic acid, which can have improved absorption. Um, so once again, making sure that you're picking the right dose and you're picking the right form of a supplement is really important. And when it comes to all of these nutrients, it's very individualized. So working with a dietitian to find out how much we could get from food and how much we could get from supplements is going to be your best bet. And then I just want to mention one last thing when it comes to all supplements. Once again, the FDA does not regulate these. So we really have to do our due diligence when it comes to being a consumer and make sure we're getting products that are high quality. And one of the best ways we could do that is by choosing supplements that are USP verified, which is a United States pharmacopoeia. And by looking for this uh, symbol on your supplement label, it's shown that the company has submitted their product for third-party testing of purity, quality, and um, consistency, I think is the third one. So that means that every single tablet in every single bottle, if it says it has 100 milligrams of this, supplement, of this vitamin, every single tablet in every single bottle has 100 milligrams. There is no um, byproducts. There are no um, accidental... Um, manufacturing ingredients in there that shouldn't be in there, heavy metals, things like that. Um, so that is a great way to make sure that you're making good supplement choices. Um, and that's, that's my answer for that question. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, before we move on to the next question, and there's also a couple in the chat, uh, Steph and Emily, did you have anything to add to what Francesca just mentioned or should we move on? She explained it beautifully. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Okay, I perfect. agree. Great answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another question that came in uh, last week through the RSVP system. Does eating sugar, examples, sweets, chocolates, fuel cancer? Not speaking about putting on weight or obesity, but simply eating a piece of chocolate or a cookie every day with an otherwise healthy diet of veggies, grains, and fruits. 
I will take this answer. Okay, um, thanks, so, so from what she's asking, does one sweet treat a day while eating a healthy diet cause or increase risk for cancer? The answer is no. And so the reason, the reason that is, is so cancer is an inflammatory illness and it's um, being overweight or obese increases that risk even more. So when someone's talking about sugar that feeds cancer, it's kind of this waterfall effect concept in the sense of all these sugary foods, junk foods, processed foods cause inflammation in the body. And so if we're eating a ton of these sugary foods throughout the day, we're constantly causing this chain of inflammation in our body. And in addition to that, a lot of these sugary foods have a lot of empty calories, a lot of saturated fat that over time can lead to weight gain and being overweight also causes this chronic and constant inflammation in the body. So the idea is that if someone's following a very anti-inflammatory diet filled with fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, and then you're just gonna have one serving of chocolate a day, that's not enough to spike this inflammation. It's not enough to cause weight gain. Um, so one piece of chocolate or one dessert a day is fine. We just really wanna limit it to one serving. The other thing with sugar and feeding cancer, I often also get asked about, does fruit have too much sugar? Or I hear bananas have sugar, can I have those? And so natural sugars, so things found in fruits, dried fruits, whole grains, those provide a lot of vitamins, minerals, fiber, antioxidants. They're all very important um, nutrients that we need. And so those do not feed cancer. They don't cause inflammation. They don't lead to weight gain. So whenever you hear that, that phrase sugar feeds cancer, it is false. And we just want to be mindful of limiting those processed sugars and refined grains to about one serving a day. Okay, understood. Thank you. Uh, so a couple of questions. It's by the same person in the, in the chat here. Um, okay, I'm going to try to organize this. So I believe this is a person with myelodysplastic syndrome, and they're asking, can I consume raw sushi and oysters at, with, you know, having that diagnosis? Okay, I can take this question. Okay. <laughs> so um, again, a lot of times questions about like whether or not specific foods you can have with a specific diagnosis would still be individualized. Um, but since myelodysplastic syndrome is one that can affect the cells in the bone marrow, um, I know I, that sometimes the blood counts can vary if you are getting treatment for this um, syndrome, known short and short as MDS. So if you are fluctuating blood counts because you're on a treatment and your doctor has told you that you're at risk for um, you know, more at risk for infections or foodborne illness, then I would definitely say raw oysters and seafood in general are considered a high risk food. So we really don't recommend across the board eating those foods just because they can cause a foodborne illness. And it's especially important for any cancer patient who's undergoing a treatment that could be affecting their blood cells um, to avoid consuming those foods. Because if you get an infection, your immunity is just a little bit suppressed by your treatment and you don't want to risk um, having an infection at that time, especially. But I would say generally for even healthy people, it's considered a high risk food too. Um, so again, it would be individualized, but in general, I would say cook, thoroughly cooked seafood is what's recommended by um, the food safety guidelines. Okay, got it. And I think uh, just to add to that from the same person, uh, is fish oil okay? Same as vitamin E. I think she's asking, is fish oil the same as vitamin E? And Separately, is fish oil okay to take? So I, I can answer this too, if sure. that works. Um, so omega uh, fish oil is commonly used as a supplement for omega-3 fatty acids, and that's different than vitamin E. Um, vitamin E is a fat-soluble vitamin, but that would be a separate supplement um, and a separate nutrient that you would find in food. So um, fish oil, again, people um, commonly might take this because it's a source of those omega-3 fatty acids, which um, have been shown may be anti-inflammatory in the body. Um, with any supplement, you know, we always recommend getting it from food first if possible. So 
if you're someone that can eat fish and enjoy seafood that's high in omega-3s like salmon and tuna, sardines and foods like that, that can be a great way to get your omega-3s um, two to three times a week just having fish with one of your meals. Um, there's also some plant-based sources of the precursors for them as well. Um, so a lot of nuts and seeds have these fats as well. The plant-based fats in general are um, the ones that can also be good sources of these nutrients. Um, I think with a fish oil supplement, it's really important to consider that these can interact with really common medications like some blood thinners like warfarin. Um, and also sometimes they're like big, hard to swallow pills. They can have a fishy taste and they can also cause like what Francesca referred to earlier. They can sometimes cause gastrointestinal upset. So what, that's where you would want to talk to your oncology dietitian um, or maybe um, set up a consultation with one if you don't already have someone that you're working with. Because we could look at your medications. We can look at your diet and say, do we think that you're someone that could benefit from getting omega-3 supplementation? Because there are some cases where we might recommend that. But I can't say across the board that anyone should or shouldn't take an omega-3 because it can have um, some pretty serious interactions with other medications. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Let's see here, Q&A. Oh, someone's asking, how can I get an appointment with either of these people today? <laughs> so that's a great question. I um, Mostly, so we have an outpatient nutrition practice here. And also if you're working with an oncologist at, um, at New York Presbyterian, it requires a physician referral or order um, to see a dietitian. Um, and so if you aren't meeting with one of us already, um, you can reach out to Health Outreach. So I think Antonio, right, <laughs> ladies, if you can clarify, um, to help guide because we all work with different doctors and practices here at New York Presbyterian. So um, it might be more appropriate for you to see one or a different of us um, for the most um, specific advice. So is that accurate? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that was on your slides. You had help outreach on there. I'm not sure if yeah. there's a number or something we could share out with the video recording for this. Uh -huh. Yeah. We could talk offline about what that, that, that looks like for this individual. Yeah, that sounds great. Great. Uh, so any other questions anyone has, any attendees, please write in the chat. Uh, I have a question for you all, just for myself, if that's okay, while we give people time to write in. Uh, so the three of you, your registered dietitians, You've been doing this for quite some time. So knowing what you know as dietitians and you know experts in the oncology nutrition space specifically, what is one thing you wish everybody knew or all your patients knew and did? How about that? Do you mean like right now or just in general? I think in general. I think this could be okay. more of a general, yeah, from your perspective, one thing you you would you would like your patients to know. I think I can I one thing came to my head pretty quickly. Um, and I think one thing I really like about working with oncology patients is a lot of people really look to nutrition as a way to help improve their health and help them to tolerate treatment better and you know to feel stronger and better. And um, I think that's one thing that is really great, but also can sometimes cause a little bit of stress about eating the wrong thing or having, you know, having something once and having that, you know, cause something um, to kind of cause something bad to happen. So I think I always like to encourage people to definitely seek individual advice from a dietitian, but also to try not to stress too much about foods being, you know, healthy, unhealthy, cancer promoting, cancer this. Um, I think there's a lot of advertising out there that tries to kind of take advantage of that. Um, and really by working with a dietitian, we can help you give good advice um, on healthy foods to include. And I think moderation is key for a lot of people. Um, so just like trying to relax and understand that, you know, there's oftentimes a place for all foods to fit with what you're eating. And um, so just trying to relieve some of that stress from yourself um, and working with somebody who's an expert in the field can be a really great way to help you do that as well. Oh, Francesca, you're muted. <laughs> unmuted, we can hear you. I am muted. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, I have to second that. That's exactly what came to my head was um, 
like food food is nourishing to us um there isn't so much of bad food than good foods um it's really more of habits and patterns that create negative or positive effects of food on our bodies and i like to always use the phrase um just to kind of like give you an example of what i talk about is like i always say like treats not cheats um <laughs> because a lot of times we like we like to associate negative connotations with food and i think that creates like a bad relationship with food and i always think like food is a relationship and i like people to know that you have a relationship with food and it needs to be a healthy one and if you were in a relationship with anyone else and there was cheating in the relationship, that wouldn't be a good relationship. <laughs> if you were in a relationship with anyone else and there was treats, that would be a great relationship. So I think that's something <laughs> I like people to know. <laughs> I like that. Emily? So I agree with both Steph and Francesca. I was going to say something similar, but taking another <laughs> spin on what they were saying is that try not to give in to all these fad diets and reading what the internet says. A lot of the patients I work with are so anxious, especially now between going through treatment and dealing with this pandemic. You know, I think it's very easy to get caught up in, you know, all these fad diets or this is a superfood. I can only eat this food or this is a bad food. It's going to give me cancer and trying to just understand that food is medicine, food is nourishment and that like what Francesca and Steph were both saying, you know, variety is key. There's room for everything. There's room for your glass of wine. There's room for your piece of cake. And just try not to give in to Googling or looking at these bad diets and, you know, just always run them by us too. We can always try to explain yeah. what they're trying to say or what they're trying to promote so you understand it better. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad we all, you, all three of you came up with the same message. It's really reinforcing for me. So. Uh, okay, a couple more questions came in here. Um, you mentioned that a serving of chocolate is okay. How big is a serving? Good question. So that will vary on the food. So if you were to look at the chocolate bar, for example, you just want to look at the back of the nutrition label and it will tell you there. So if it's you know, some candies will say three squares or three Hershey, Hershey Kisses. Um, other candies will have six little pieces. Ice cream, which is one of my favorites, for example, is usually a half a cup measuring cup. So just look on the back and try to make sure you're sticking to that guideline because, you know, it'll vary from item to item. Okay. Uh, another one here. Do you see a lot of patients who are looking for nutritional fixes and supplements that can cure them? All three say yes. All yes. the time. All yeah. the time. It's like we're all shaking our heads. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, I, could, I could take that one if you guys want. Sure. sure. Yeah. So, um, I do see a lot of the times and some of the questions I ask when we or I would say, first of all, is like the way I approach supplements is safe and effective. So if it's not safe and it's not effective, then why are we using it? And so a lot of the times people will come with me to me with supplements and they're taking them and I say, why are you taking this? And they say, I don't know. I think it's good for me. I think it's for my immune system. I, I don't know. I don't, they, I don't know. So um, trying to keep in mind those two things. Um, Unfortunately, though, I do see a lot of supplements that are, have a ton of marketing towards cancer patients in particular. And um, when I do the research into their backgrounds, I mean, I just think of this one company that comes to mind, a lot of their information was like antioxidants, inflammation, inflammation and cancer, and comes to find out it's a husband and wife team that are like two mathematicians that started selling a skincare product from their dermatologist and eventually got into dietary supplements. So, you know, once you like dig into these companies, you really find out like a lot of it is, is really kind of a scam. Um, but the marketing is so good. I could sometimes when I'm, when they're bringing it to me, I'm looking at this, I'm like, Oh my God, this looks so good. Why didn't I think of telling someone to take this? And then once you do the actual research, you realize like, wow, it's the marketing that's good. And that's about all they have going for them. And I'd like to add too to that, that a lot of people, get supplements that are really expensive. Um, and so you have these uh, supplements that aren't regulated, so we don't actually know what's in them. They may 
not even be helpful, could potentially even be harmful, and sometimes they can cost hundreds of dollars. And so some people are taking long lists of these and they're spending so much money on these supplements that we really, you know, that really may not be doing anything for them and could potentially be harmful. So I think that's another thing to realize is that, you know, it's, it's a marketing ploy because they, a lot of the time they want you to spend money and you, you know, cancer treatment can be expensive. And I think it's, you know, money that we could spend on more healthy, nourishing foods that might meet our needs in a better way. Mm -hmm. The other thing to remember also with supplements and patients thinking that it can save them is cancer is multifactorial. You know, there's genetics, there's environmental, there's other factors that a supplement can't come back. You know, if genetically you have the BRCA gene, a supplement can't combat that. And the other thing is, if you are on a plan where you're getting chemo or you're getting radiation, we want the chemotherapy to do the job it was designed to do. We want the radiation to do the job it was designed to do. And some of these supplements, we don't know if it's going to affect the radiation or chemo. We don't know if it's going to interact in a negative way and not allow the chemo or radiation to work properly. So that's another thing to keep in mind when you're deciding about supplements, especially while getting chemo or radiation. Yeah, I, I think this question that just came into is sort of aligned with what you're talking about, Emily. So I, I think it's saying if, if a supplement is effective, isn't it a medicine rather than a supplement? And if it isn't effective, how can we protect ourselves and our fellow patients from this marketing? That's it. So, I mean, I would say, I'm going to answer it in reverse. How do we protect people from it? I think working with someone who specializes in oncology nutrition is 100% number one way you're going to protect yourself from marketing. Even if you see something that sounds interesting, bring it to us. I'm ha we're always happy to do the research on it before we give you a hard yes or no. And then the first part of the question, could you repeat it? I'm sorry. Yeah. If a supplement is effective, isn't it a medicine rather than a supplement? Okay. So, okay. So that's a good question. So not technically. Um, and the example I'm going to use is let's say somebody has iron deficiency anemia and we are giving them iron, an iron supplement. It doesn't become a medication. It's still a dietary supplement, but it could be a prescription dietary supplement. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. To me, yeah, yes. That's, yeah. okay. That was clear, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so going back to the chat here, there, the Q&A. Um, um, okay, how do you fight sugar cravings? That's a good question. <laughs> I can start if, if you want, guys. Sure. sure. So with, with sugar cravings, um, oftentimes try and look at what you're eating throughout the day. So sometimes hunger is actually masked by thirst. Um, most people are not drinking enough water. The other thing is, you know, are you depleting yourself of other carbohydrates? So if your energy is low, so if you're restricting grains or restricting fruit because you think it has too much sugar, your body is kind of basically trying to tell you that I need a boost of energy. I need some, I need sugar to boost my energy. So try to look at what you're eating throughout the day. You know, are you eating small frequent meals and nourishing yourself throughout the day? Are you getting a wide variety of nutrients? Are you allowing yourself to have fruit and whole grains to kind of keep that energy and momentum up throughout the day? Are you hydrated? You know, because it's very easy. Oftentimes when people are craving sugar, it's because their blood sugar is low. They haven't eaten in many hours and they're looking for that quick, thick sugar spike. The other thing with sugar to keep in mind is it's very hard to do, but if you try to limit all these concentrated sweets for three to four weeks, your taste buds over time turn over. They die and you grow new ones. And so when you restrict sweets, it's very hard in the beginning. Your tongue is constantly craving them, but over time, and if you stick with it, it gets easier. And you actually, as your taste buds turn over and you get new ones, you actually stop craving that sugar flavor on your tongue, believe it or not. So just mm -hmm. try to hang in there and fight the urge, have some fresh fruits or, you know, practice portion control and limiting the, the sugar. Yeah. 
Um, and I think to add to that too, um, having meals and snacks that are full of protein and fiber can also help combat cravings. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't be sweet tasting. Um, an example I will use would be, let's say at nighttime, you really like to have like Reese's peanut butter cups. Um, if you were to replace that with two squares of 75% dark chocolate with some peanut butter on top sprinkled with pumpkin seeds or flaxseed, ground flaxseed or both, that's a ton of protein, a ton of fiber, ton of nutrients. It's probably going to taste sweet, um, but there's really not a lot of sugar and there's very minimal added sugar there. So that's another way to help, especially when you're transitioning, like Emily's saying, if you typically habitually eat a lot of sweets, helping your body wean off of those cravings. Um, okay, uh, what's the best way for patients to facilitate collaboration between their oncologists and their nutritionists? That's a good question. Yeah. Come to an... Wild Cornell. I feel like it's not going to well. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think here we work closely with a lot of doctors. Um, if there's something specific um, that you have a question about that you think you, know, you want both of us to have our input on and you know you can always touch base with both of us like connect us um, I think we oftentimes do a lot of collaboration with the doctors that we work with but if that's not the case with your dietitian and doctor I think you could probably just connect them and um, I think in my experience, you know, they're always happy to talk to me and get my thoughts. And I'm always happy to collaborate with doctors as well. Um, it's a very collaborative field in oncology. So I would say just if it's something that you have a question or something about just connecting the two is an easy way to do that. You also as the patient might not see when you meet with everyone individually, but behind the scenes, you know, us as dietitians, we're constantly talking with the physicians and nurse practitioners and social work. So even if you might not see it when you're meeting with providers one-on-one, -on -one, behind the scenes, there is a lot of discussion and collaboration of care to make sure we're all giving the patient the best answer for them. Good. Uh, there's one more question here that I think could be probably answered before 6.30, a couple minutes from now. Um, is beef a good food for MDS? Yeah. Sorry. Steph, do you want to take the other MDS one? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think this, again, is a very individual question. I know we keep saying that, but I think it really is true. Um, I think, you know, I think beef is a rich source of certain nutrients like iron and things that can be important for your healthy blood cell formation, which, as I mentioned, MDS does affect your marrow cells, so that can be important. But it's not the only source of these nutrients. And I think also, like there's um, certain risks of having too much red meat, and that can be correlated with other chronic conditions. So I think, again, it's, it comes down to what do you like to eat? What does your diet consist of? Are there other sources of these nutrients in your diet? Do you like the food? Um, you know, is it something that culturally, you know, is important in your diet? So I think we take all of those things into consideration and say if there's like a certain amount that you would want to shoot for. Um, but I think, I don't know if I can specifically say that beef is good or bad for MDS. It comes down to like the individual and are there certain nutrients in beef that could maybe be beneficial for you in certain amounts during the week. Um, so again, I would say an individualized question, um, a consultation would probably be the best way to answer that for you. So we can like find out everything you eat and all those things. Makes sense. Uh, we did have one question come through. I know it's 6.30, but maybe we can answer this one. Uh, what are your thoughts on Beyond Meat and Impossible Burgers, especially as to nutritional content and digestibility? We get that question a lot, too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to answer, but if you guys, I feel like I've been talking a lot. If you want to go. I, I, I feel the I same can, way, so. <laughs> I can okay. answer it. Okay. Uh, 
So with the Beyond Meat products, my tr they're very highly processed. And so the thing to remember with any tofu or vegan option that's meant to look or taste like meat is very highly processed. And so the way these Beyond Burgers and Beyond Meat, the way they get them to taste like meat is they take this concentrated, concentrated dose of plant-based heme and they, it's very carcinogenic, it's very, very processed. So you're much better off just choosing real fresh meat, or if you're looking for vegetarian options, looking for things like a veggie burger, and you want it with a veggie burger, you wanna make sure you can see the beans and quinoa and chunks of veggies in there. But any of these vegan options that look like meat, we wanna to try to limit them as much as possible. They're extremely highly processed. And I would say we don't have like a ton of research on like the Beyond Burger, but there have been like a few studies that just compared and the plant-based sources of proteins that we see can be so beneficial for improving health conditions and reducing risk of disease. Um, we don't always, we, they didn't see the same effect with sort of the plant-based meat substitutes that are these highly processed um, meats that Emily was referring to. So I think, you know, if it's something where it helps you to work on, you know, getting more plant-based foods into your lifestyle, maybe as a short-term thing, some people like that, um, getting used to not eating as much meat. But I think the whole foods are definitely what we push and avoiding processed foods in general, including these. Mm -hmm. And they also tend to be very high in sodium, which could be the trade-off for like the saturated fat in the specific like nutrient comparison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you. And thank you for being a couple minutes over. Uh, I want to thank Francesca, Emily, Stephanie. You were all terrific. I know I learned a lot. Uh, and thank you to our attendees to, for uh, spending your early evening with us. I hope these are beneficial to you and definitely more to come. Um, so with that, everyone be safe, be well, wash those hands. <laughs> See you next time. Bye, all right, thank thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Have thank a good night. You.